This is Father Mark Foley, OCD, St. Teresa and Scruples. This is going to be Conference 3. Conference 3, Part 1. Be take it. Conference 3, we call it Side A. Michigan. And again, we welcome our brothers and sisters in of Carmel in Sri Lanka, Brazil, in Atlanta, in Lansing, Flint, Britain, and all of those that our hearts are one with. Father Mark Farley, OCD, um, our uh, treasured um, retreat master will continue with his theme on St. Therese. St. Therese. For the past few decades, uh, much of our Western culture has instinctively turned to Eastern spirituality in a search for what we might call an antidote to kind of our Western way of being of self-conquest and self-reliance, a rigid individualism, kind of a social Darwinism that permeates so much of our collective psyche. And one of the things that has been found, if you're acquainted with some of the Eastern texts, is a more gentle acceptance of reality that avoids the extremes of harshness and fatalism. However, we need not turn to the East to find an antidote. One of the foremost Chinese philosophers and statesmen of the last century, Dr. John Wu, who was a Buddhist philosopher, was once given uh, a copy of the story of the soul and it had two consequences in his life. It was one of the main catalysts that converted him to Catholicism and secondly he said that after reading the story of the soul that for the first time in his life he truly understood the wisdom of the Chinese sages. Now, considering uh, the stature of this man in Chinese philosophy, I consider this rather a remarkable statement. Um, sometimes being outside of a culture and seeing it through different eyes gives us a perspective of things that we, we, we cannot see. And for example, in uh, the Lao Tzu, if you read that, it speaks about spiritual perfection is reached by not anxiously striving after it. There is a union of opposites between exerting effort without strain and self-acceptance without complacency. We see this in the spirituality of St. Therese. Now, I would like to read a passage from St. Therese and try to listen to it as if you were reading something out of an old ancient manuscript from ancient China, okay? And kind of put yourself in that frame of mind, like a, a piece of a, a wisdom literature. She writes, be like a little child. Practice 
all of the virtues, and so always lift up your little foot to mount the ladder of holiness. But do not imagine that you will be able to ascend even the first step. No, the good Lord does not demand more from you than your good will. From the top of the stairs, he looks at you with love. And very soon, won over by your useless efforts, he will come down and take you in his arms. He will carry you up. But if you stop lifting your little foot, he will leave you for a long time on the ground. The first thing that St. Therese speaks about in this passage is one of the main paradoxes of grace, namely that our efforts are utterly useless but absolutely necessary in the spiritual life. And you have to keep both of them side by side. Absolutely useless. Utterly necessary, utterly useless, but absolutely necessary. It's a, it's a paradox. And this is kind of a, a paradoxical wisdom of Tread. Now, I'm going to be saying something for the next four or five minutes. And if you can grasp what I'm trying to say, it can turn your whole spiritual life upside down. Okay? And this isn't me, this is Therese. Be like a child. Always lift up your little foot to mount the stair of holiness, but do not imagine that you will be able to ascend even the first stair. Always try, but don't even imagine that you're going to, going to succeed. Now, everything in my Western training says to me, that is absolutely crazy. Why would you try if you presuppose from the very beginning that you're going to fail? That is absolute craziness. And I think Trez says, Mark, you got it all wrong. In fact, it's the way out of craziness. Because frustration is a consequence of failure. In the passage that I just read from Therese is not an image of frustration because the effort and the goal are one and the same. It's only when a goal is in the accomplishment beyond the effort itself that we create frustration. Because until or if you're able to get your little leg up over the stair, you're going to be frustrated. But what if the goal is in the trying? In the very nature that you're trying, you've met your goal. Continue to lift up your foot, but take it for granted that you're going to fail. In other words, when you begin something, let go of your need for results before you begin. Let's take an example of the importance of effort without trying to accomplish anything. I'd like to read a couple of passages concerning St. Therese's work with her novices as an example of this. In her last conversations, she writes to her, her sister Pauline, to the right and to the left, I throw to my little birds the good
good seed that God places in my hand. And then I let it let things take their course. I busy myself with it no more. Sometimes it's just as though I have thrown nothing. At other times it does some good. But God tells me, give always without being concerned about the results. To her sister Celine, Trez writes something similar. Ever since I took over the novitiate, my life has been one war and struggle. But my only desire has been to please God. Consequently, I have not desired that my efforts bear any fruit. True, we must always sow the seed of goodness on all sides. There's a prayer that Saint, that, that um, Freudian slipped there. There's a prayer that T.S. Eliot makes in his, uh, in his poem, Ash Wednesday. He writes, Lord, teach us to care and not to care and how to sit still our peace is in your will. The passages that I have just read from Therese breathes peace because Therese was able to differentiate the right kind of care from the wrong type of care. The good care is in the attentiveness in the doing the bad care that drives us crazy is in the worry about the outcome. And the peace is solid because it's rooted in reality. This is one of Trez's characteristics. She's a hard core realist. Can you make people listen to you? Now, if you don't know the answer to that question by now, I don't think I have to tell you. <laughs> Can you make people change? Life is like the parable of the sower. I think the parable of the sower came out of our Lord's imagination because of his own experience. If you've ever given a talk before a group, you look out and some people are open, some people are just like, you know, I, I defy you to, you know, tell me something I'm going to accept. Some people are bored, some people don't care. It's like all the different soils. Life is like the parable of the sower. You can be Jesus Christ with the best message in your hand, and you are absolutely powerless to change other people's lives. It depends upon the soil that it lands on. See, we have this idea in our mind that frustration is the result that we don't see results. That's not true. Frustration is a result that we are, we are attached to seeing results. Can you be at peace after you've said your peace? Can you just simply walk away from it? Can you simply do your, God's will and let God take care of the rest and mind your own business? God's not up for re-election this year, <laughs> you know. As St. Paul says, I plant the seed, Apollos waters it, but God makes it grow. You know, we are absolutely powerless to make seeds grow. 
we're often frustrated when we talk to someone because they don't listen to us and we say to ourselves, what a waste of time. Why? Because our goal is in that the person changes. In other words, our goal is not identical with the activity. What if your goal was simply to say the words that God wanted you to say, period? Then by the very saying of them, you've accomplished your goal. But we always look beyond the power that we have and we, we, and we create our own powerlessness because we have a fictitious goal in our mind of something that we can't actualize. And that's why Tres says, I throw my seeds at the birds of the left and the right, and I don't give it a second thought. If some benefit by it, that's fine. If others don't, that's fine. You know, what did I say this weekend to you? If it, you know, it's really none of my business whether it makes any difference in your lives. That's really none of my business. My business is to do the best preparation I can and do a prayerful, pre and do a prayerful presentation. And then simply just walk out of here and really not give, you know, look over the shoulder of my thoughts and wonder, gee, I wonder if I really help people. That's really none of my business. As St. Francis de Sales once said, quote, God will not ask us how much we have reaped, but have we taken care in the sowing? Have we simply done our job? So where do you begin in situations like this? Well, St. Therese said that you have to prepare your heart beforehand. And you can do some some mental work. I mean, there's a there's a great line in uh, Shakespeare's Henry V, where Henry is about to lead his men in the battle, and at the end of the great St. Crispin's Day speech, he turns to his men and he says, "All things are ready if our minds be so." And that's a great piece of advice. If we prepare ourselves mentally. Before we go into a situation, we can save ourselves a lot of grief. For example, if you have discerned that God wants you to say something to someone, before you go in, imagine yourself talking to the person and the person not listening to you or accepting what you have to say. Imagine that in your mind and say, okay, can I accept that? And begin to realize, Lord, if, you, if your will is simply for me to say it, then I've accomplished my will in the saying. Uh, C.S. Lewis once said that it's, that it's often the person that has argued you down that 20 years later, what you've said is going to be the seed that God's going to use. But you'll never know. 20 years, that's a long time, isn't it? 30 years, I think, you know. Maybe it will be, and maybe it won't be. But, you know, if you take a few minutes to do that mentally, and imagine the worst-case scenario, and you're able to accept that mentally, say, you know, I don't like it, but I can stand it. It's going to be okay. Then you've detached yourself mentally from that. You know, and you save yourself a lot of grief, too, because you're standing on reality of what is differentiating what you can do from what you can't do. It's differentiating, uh, you know, doing the will of God and letting God do his own work, okay? And there's a lot, there's a lot more peaceful way to, to live. Let's take another example having to do with expectations. In this example, St. Therese is talking to her blood sister, Pauline, and Pauline feels very hurt because she has just done a kindness to someone 
without receiving thanks or recognition for her kindness. Okay, can you place yourself in that situation? Okay. And Trez responds as follows, quote, I assure you, I too experience the feelings you are speaking about. However, I don't allow myself to be trapped by them, for I expect no reward. I do everything for God, and in this way, I lose nothing. Yes, Trez did feel the natural sting of ingratitude. But she says that she did not allow herself to become trapped by these feelings because of what she did not bring to the situation. And that was expectations. You know, doing everything for God and not expecting a reward is not magnanimous at all. It's simply a very sane way of living. It's often the expectations, the unconscious expectations that we bring to life that makes us absolutely angry and miserable. I have a friend whose family has a corporate gift of making the holidays absolutely miserable. Um, and the, the way they do it is this. They all bring to the Thanksgiving dinner or uh, the Christmas celebration these expectations that these holidays should be something out of a Norman Rockwell painting, you know? And they have this kind of this mental image unconsciously before their minds and you know it never lines up with reality you know in fact getting together with relatives is probably the most <laughs> difficult situation you know they could get I mean there's nobody that can pull our strings better than our family family of origin you know I mean I, I, I honestly think it's a major miracle that more homicides don't happen around you know Thanksgiving and Christmas around, you know, the Christmas heart, so to speak, you know, uh, just because it's very, very difficult. Now, objectively, their holidays are okay, but they always go away disgruntled because, well, <coughs> they just never measure up. And the reason they don't measure up is because it's unreality, the expectations that, that, that they bring to the situation. My favorite American philosopher, you might have heard of, might have listened to him on the radio. I listen to two things on the radio. I listen to Car Talk. You know, it's, a great, it's a great show. I always waste, waste an hour of my precious youth to listen to Car Talk, you know, click and clank. And Garrison Keillor's Lake Wobegon days. Yeah. It's, it's a, he has a fictitious, he has a monologue about this fictitious place in upper Minnesota called Lake Wobegon. And in one of his monologues, Keeler says, the reason why people in Lake Wobegon are happy is because for them, good enough is good enough. Now there's a lot of wisdom in that. I mean, the more you expect life to be tailored to your expectations, the more frustrated and angry you're going to be. I mean, life is off the rack, folks, isn't it? It's never a perfect fit. It never works out. And, and we say when we're frustrated, what is frustrated? What is frustrated is the plans and the images and the expectations that we bring to situations. The next time you feel hurt, or angry because a person's because of a person's lack of response, say to an act of kindness, ask yourself this question, and this is not a rhetorical question. What was I expecting? Sometimes we feel let down because 
we do an act of kindness to somebody, and you know what they do in return? They say thank you. <laughs> you know why? Because we were expecting them to make a big deal out of it. Have you ever noticed that life doesn't cater to your imagination? <laughs> you know? I mean, Trez, Trez learned this, you know, after her Christmas conversion. Now, as we know, Trez was a very, very pampered child. You know, she was, uh, she never did any housework. She never even made her bed. She, you know, she had her hair combed by her uh, sisters until she was 11 years old. I mean, when she went to the boarding school for a retreat, she didn't even know how to comb her hair. I mean, she was, she was like a little china doll, you know? So after her Christmas conversion, she's trying to make a change. And she says, being the youngest of the family, I wasn't accustomed to doing things for myself. Celine tidied up the room in which we slept, and I myself didn't do any housework whatsoever. After Marie entered Carmel, it sometimes happened that I tried to make up the bed to please God, or else in the evening, when Celine was away, I'd bring in her plants. But as I already said, it was for God alone I was doing these things, and should have and, and should not have expected any thanks from creatures. But the opposite was true. If Celine was unfortunate enough not to seem happy or surprised because of these little services, I became unhappy and proved it by my tears. I mean, she did a little thing, and she watered the plants. And Celine came back, and she didn't make a big deal out of it. Oh my God, you didn't notice what I did. Because in her mind, this was a big deal. You know? What compliments are you expecting from people? Nice job. Nice job. That's all. That's all you got. It was great. Nice job. I mean, you know, because... My God, dude. How can you be so cruel? <laughs> that you're not reading what I expect you to say. I mean... Listen, here's the script. See? This is what you're supposed to say. You know? I made a, oh, I talked about a real group of once. I was uh, working in a parish, and uh, this lady came in with a new hat. And I said, that's a nice hat. My God. I mean, she just, I mean, she was really taken back. I mean, nice hat? Dynamite. That's what you're supposed to say. You know? You know, I mean, what you're expecting people to say. You know? But it's true. When you feel hurt because somebody hasn't given an, what you consider an appropriate response, appropriate regarding what? <coughs> of the script in your mind, of how much. You know, you need to be praised. You know, if you can let go of that, we can cause ourselves just so much, um, you know, uh, uh, the insanity uh, within our lives. Um, the world says that the hurt is the result of not receiving thanks. In other words, the problems out there. Now, Trez would agree with this to a certain degree as a natural reaction, but she says the real source of our hurt, that is the hurt that can fester, is in looking beyond the action for the reward. I expect no reward. I do everything for God, and this way I lose nothing. In other words, the reward the goal and the doing are one and the same. If I'm going to do an act of kindness for somebody, make that the goal. And don't even expect to get recognition from it. Do some mental work. 
because you're causing your own hurt. That person isn't hurting you. Now, you might say, well, isn't it natural that somebody should thank me for doing them a kindness? Yes. Shouldn't they thank me? Yes. Wouldn't it be a better world if they thank me? Yes. <laughs> uh, but you know, we don't live in a perfect world. And you, and you ask yourself this question, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? You know, that's often the choice. Yeah, you're right, you're 100% correct, but you can be miserable at the same time. Yeah. <clears throat> You would hope they would, but you know, often people don't. Can you accept that? And can you let go of those expectations? That's our choice. Do you want to hold on to them? That's fine. Everyone has a God-given right to be miserable. You know? <laughs> and you know, and the more we can accept that so much of our misery is self-inflicted, then we empower ourselves that we can do something about it. But the more we say it's out there, then we give our power away, because we can't change the world around us. And that was Trez's sanity. You know, I cast my seed to the left and to the right. If people listen, that's fine if they don't. That's not apathy. That's reality. Apathy is, I'm not going to do a damn thing. I want to cast the seed. That's apathy. Tress wasn't apathetic. She was detached from the results of her labors. Okay? Um, <coughs> if we're looking for a reward beyond our action, then there's still a string attached to our love, and that is the string to be recognized. What is at the core of Trez's sanity is giving <coughs> freely. I do everything for God which has allowed me to let go of my expectations. The doing is the reward. They're one and the same. She's not looking beyond the action. How do we practice freely? Trez said that one of the reasons we get hurt, one of the reasons we blow up over situations is that we haven't taken time to prepare ourselves mentally before going into a situation. About 12 years ago, I was a director of a retreat house up in uh, Peterborough, New Hampshire. And on the weekends, there's, uh, this man used to uh, help us in the kitchen. We'd have a room for him in the back, and he'd help us with the meals and, uh, you know, with the pots and pans and what have you. And he was a very uh, generous man, a very gregarious uh, person, somebody you would like to talk to. Um, but with one exception. At 5 o'clock in the morning, when I would come down for my coffee, there he would be, as perky as ever, <laughs> wanting to engage me in conversation. <laughs> now, because we're in chapel, I, I, I will not tell you what they should do to perky people in the morning. <laughs> So, I'd be standing there, and he'd be excited about something, out of, like maybe he had just read out of St. Teresa, and I'm standing there, and I'm saying, oh, God, I, I really hate St. Teresa. You know, I, oh, I wish you would just keep quiet. So, and after a while, I began to feel a resentment towards him. Now, resentment is that a species of anger when you feel trapped, that you don't have a choice. Now, obviously, this man was not holding a gun to my head, but I felt I was trapped because 
if I was short with him, if I were curt and kind of ended the conversation quickly, I would have felt guilty. And probably rightly so. I mean, if I can give this man five minutes of my time, huh? <coughs> now, I don't know about you, but if I have to choose between being angry and feeling guilty, there's no contest. I'll choose anger every time. So I felt trapped. I felt this resentment that I was being forced to do something that I didn't want to do. Well, around this time, I read something that St. Therese used to do. Now, as, as you know, she was uh, put in her obedience to write uh, the story of a soul. And she had very, very little time to do this, very little free time. And as she would be trying to write, you know, she'd get a knock on the door, and maybe one of the sisters would come and say, excuse me, Sister Tress, could, could I speak to you for a minute? Now, let me tell you what a Carmelite minute is. <laughs> you know. Now, Therese, being a hardcore realist knew that this situation was not going to disappear. Because in daily life, when you try to sit down and do something, often you are interrupted. Knowing this, what Trez used to do is before she would write, she would close her eyes and make a decision imagining this person coming in and imagining, okay, Lord, if I'm interrupted, I'll put down what I'm doing and I'll attend to this person. Now, when I read that, my way out of the resentment became very, very clear. Because the next time I walked into the kitchen on the weekend in the morning, unless this man had a personality transplant, I knew what I was going to encounter. So before I went in, I just took a moment, imagined him being excited about something, and making a decision. Okay, Mark, you're not going to like this, and you never will, and don't expect yourself to like this. You're not a morning person. But make a decision to simply attend to him for five minutes. And once I made that decision, the resentment was gone. I still don't like it now, okay? But the reason the resentment was gone is I no longer felt my time was being taken away from me because I already made a decision to let it go. That's not semantics. Now, that's such a practical piece of advice out of St. Therese, because life is so predictable. St. Paul says, God loves a cheerful giver. Inwardly decide beforehand what you're going to give. And the reason it's such a practical piece of advice is because so many situations in life are predictable. You know that whenever you encounter certain people, you're going to have the same internal reaction. If you know that, why can't you take a moment before and just say, okay, this person is going to make me angry or what have you, and I'm just going to take it for granted they will, and you know, I'm just going to feel this anger for a while, I'm going to talk to myself as this is happening, and I'm not going to let it explode. I mean, you know it's going to happen. And we tell ourselves crazy things. You know, like, I don't believe she said that again. She's always saying that. Well, wait a minute. If you know, if she's always saying it, then why can't you believe she's going to say it? It's so predictable. You know it. What do you mean you can't believe it? I mean, if, if you know it, I mean, Taking five minutes before of doing some mental work 
is going to save you two hours of your stomach churning later. I mean, it's cost effective. You know, it, it, it really is. And also, it's more charitable too. You know, I mean, before you go into this, you can also make it a prayer. Okay, Lord, I'm going to feel this, and you know, I'm going to offer this up for the love of God for this person. I'm always going to react the same way to this person. I can't communicate with them. They're on a completely different wavelength. But I can communicate the most important thing in the world, and that is I can make a choice to love this person by bearing what I'm feeling. You, you put complete meaning in the whole situation. And now you're no longer frustrated because you've accomplished a goal. You really are loving this person. At the same time, you're extremely angry with this person. There's no contradiction there. Because love is on the level of the will, not on the level of affect. That's why you can love a person while you're extremely angry with them at the same time. Okay, so far so good? Okay. Okay, uh, we've got to stop in, a, uh, in about 20 minutes. I have to start seeing people. So how about we stop here, and if there are any questions before um, on this conference or anything uh, that we've uh, looked at so far, three major works, her autobiography, her last conversations, uh, the two volumes of the letters. Also, I, I think that passage of the Raise Your Little Foot, um, that's more of an oral tradition. I think, I think if I remember, I got that out of uh, Saint-Hélène's memoirs, if I'm not mistaken. I, I, don't quote me on that, but I, I think that's where I got that from. So, you know, kind of primary and secondary sources, uh, things that Trez herself has written, and also uh, memories of people that knew Therese. You know, one, one good book, if you want some information on Therese, is, uh, it's, it's called um, Trez, Those Who Knew Her by, uh, uh, is it O'Malley? Christopher O'Malley, I think. And basically what it is, is there are excerpts from uh, the testimonies that were given at uh, Trez's beatification process. You know, people that lived with her, you know. <laughs>